Hi everyone, my name is Marlene and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. I actually did not have time to film a full tutorial um, this week, but I really wanted to do a weekly upload and try to be consistent with YouTube and I thought I would go ahead and just do a video telling you a little bit about developer advocacy, which is what I do now. And I've been doing developer advocacy uh, for the past five years um, in the Python OSS space. Um, and so I thought I would do this video. It's going to be really chatty. I have some coffee with me right now. Um, I asked ChatGBT what some good questions to answer about this topic would be. I will be sharing some of my favorite tools that I use, what my day-to-day -day looks like, and also some helpful tips for anyone that's also looking to get into the advocacy space. So if you're interested in any of this, please keep watching. So I have a list of questions on my phone that I got from ChatGBT um, just to help me <laughs> with this video. I'm going to try and make it short. I know I actually, after having this YouTube, have realized that I ramble. <laughs> We're going to try and keep this short and to the point. So the first question is, what does a developer advocate actually do? Um, I think this is a great question. Uh, I would say it really depends on the company that you're working for. I know some developer advocates that are amazing and they just primarily focus on the community side of things. They might not be technical, but are doing great work around building a community uh, around a product. Uh, so there is that flavor of developer advocacy. I would say for me, Usually I'm interacting with developer advocates that are primary software engineers or, you know, highly technical people, but also really enjoy communication work or teaching. These are people that usually will be advocating for developers. So external developers, you're advocating in the company for the needs of the developer community. And then you're also, you know, advocating for on behalf of the company or a company's products to the community as well. So it's kind of like a two-way thing where you are uh, moving in between both the company and the community. It's very technical. And I, I actually think a lot of the work that I do is coding most of the time. So I'm gonna say 60% of the work is actually writing code for me. The second question that ChatGPT asked me <laughs> was, um, how did I get into developer advocacy, especially in the Python and AI space? So for me, I had been, you know, I started off interning at NVIDIA a couple of years ago, and I was just primarily focusing on um, software engineering work then. And I really enjoyed that, but I, I remember even at the time I was also, I had, you know, just gotten over some burnout where I had tried to start a nonprofit teaching girls how to code in Zimbabwe. And like, I was so burnt out because it was so hard, but it was really fun because like in that process, I, I realized that I, I enjoy teaching. I also found that I really enjoy Python and communication style stuff because I had been doing a lot of advocacy work for that nonprofit I was trying to, to build. I also felt like I wanted to be more creative in some of the engineering work I was doing. I, I like to create things. So um, that's something I wanted to do more of. So I started, I met, several developer advocates, actually a Microsoft developer advocate and a Google one, when I was at a conference at PyCon. And they told me a little bit about what the role was. I had never heard about it and sounded like literally the perfect role for me and uh, was curious about it. I ended up moving to a startup that came out of NVIDIA, NVIDIA Voltron Data um, and did developer advocacy there because they allowed me, <laughs> gave me a shot to do it. Um, when I was still pretty new in that space. And so I was there for maybe three and a half years and then just recently moved over to Microsoft. What does a typical day look like for me when I am 
doing advocacy. Uh, I think our team that I work on is so fast paced. It like, I've been surprised. Microsoft in general is very fast paced. Obviously right now AI is a big thing. Python is really at the heart of that. Um, but really what my team does is I'm really balancing off different projects or interest spaces. So my focus, like I said, is Python and AI on Azure. So anything that touches that is something that I'm interested in or will do some work on in some capacity. So sometimes, you know, I mentioned that a good amount of my day is actually writing code. So I will work with the product teams to build out samples or to add a new feature to a project that they would like to see. So currently, for example, I'm working on adding a memory part to a demo um, that we're doing internally, or I will create a demonstration for a customer that's interested in using um, a framework that includes Azure in some way. And then I also get to focus on open source as well. I am really interested in open source. I have been for a long time and I enjoy working in public. I think that's really fun and learning from others. So we also have an element of our work where we can focus on open source in some capacity. Then I will also have, right now I'm working on a workshop that I'm gonna be giving at Build. So I will spend some time writing out the code for that. How do you balance coding, creating content, and community engagement? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think just some weeks are going to be heavier on one thing than the other. So some weeks I'm actually just going to be like in May, I'm going to just be going to conferences. Um, and that in those times when I'm traveling, I'm probably not going to be writing as much code. But then when I'm home, when I'm in London, I am writing code most days and really enjoying that. And then with content creation, um, really, it just depends on the day um, and what I want to do. So I am trying to do more video content with Microsoft. So we'll see, hopefully, this next quarter when I'm more stable and in London, we'll do more video content there. But I'm also, as you know, have a YouTube channel and creating content that way and, and doing some writing and things. So really it just depends on, on the week. So another question was what tools, libraries, and frameworks do I use most often in my workflow? Um, so I really spend a good amount of time in VS Code, probably my favorite tool ever. GitHub and VS Code is where I spend 70% of my time. Like if there was Word, a Word document thing where you could like create presentations or documents in VS Code, I would do it. <laughs> so I really enjoy using VS Code. I think it's been really useful with agent mode for creating out samples very quickly and, and creating out really cute or very professional samples as well. I use, I use Notion to keep track of like my schedule and I have like a nice calendar that has like color themes and things like that. For content creation, I use StreamYard to be able to film videos. I think that's been very good um, to be able to make videos. I also use Canva for my video thumbnails and things like that. I'm not hiring anyone. I haven't hired anyone to like do stuff and edit stuff for me. Oh, I also use DaVinci. Resolve because it's free. <laughs> what are what's the hardest part of being a developer advocate? I think maybe the hardest part of being a developer advocate is I tweeted about this the other day, but I think one of the hardest parts I have found is just keeping on top of what is happening in the industry because there's so much happening all the time in AI. I don't think we've ever seen a time like this. And, and, you know, I have been in this industry four or five years, and I just have not seen things moving this quickly. There's always stuff happening. There's always a new model coming out. There's always a new protocol coming out. 
<laughs> and yeah, that's, I would say the hardest part is trying to keep up with all of that without feeling burnt out, still trying to keep creative. That is kind of challenging. What's the most rewarding moment I've had in this role? So, oh, I love teaching. I love teaching. I think if I can teach something effectively that I think is like a complex thing, that just is like so fun for me. Love being able to show something in a way that people can understand and then getting feedback from people to say, this was like very helpful or giving a workshop and people saying, oh, that workshop was like very helpful for me. Like actually when I first joined, this is a funny story, when I first joined, I created a lab and I put so much effort into this lab. And the lab was using Jupyter Notebooks, by the way. Um, and we were giving this lab, you know, at different places they were using the content for it. And the feedback at some point, I thought it was going great, but the feedback at some point was that the lab was too complex. Like people said, people thought it was too much going on, too hard to set up. And I was devastated. This is very early on. I was truly devastated when I found out that that was the case. And yeah, so obviously we changed that and did a simpler lab and then got good feedback. But yeah, I enjoy teaching and getting um, good feedback. What are some skills if someone wants to be a developer advocate, what's some skills to learn? I would say the primary thing, if you are going this path of doing the more technical developer advocacy role, really get used to learning things quickly, experimenting, being curious about where the industry is taking you. I think that's probably been the, the skill that's helped me the most is that I'm genuinely interested in what's happening in the space. And so um, I love creating content around that because I'm interested in it. And I think just getting used to writing loads of code so you understand what's going on is very helpful as a skill. And then combining that, of course, like developer advocacy includes having some people interaction. Um, and, and oftentimes you're speaking at conferences, you're giving presentations. So probably getting used to doing that is a good thing to do. Any tips for developers who want to get better at public speaking or content creation? With public speaking, I won't say about content creation because <laughs> I don't feel like I'm great at it just because I'm so inconsistent. So I'm not going to give advice on that. With public speaking, practice is the only thing that's going to make it easier over time. I think everyone gets nervous. I get nervous when I'm going to give a talk or something like that. But over time, you just get used to it. Um, I have some breathing techniques, for example, that I have, have helped me with feeling nervous and, and helped calm me down. So yeah, and sometimes I just don't wear glasses. Like I actually have lost my glasses now, but I used to, I feel like I used to like actively take off my glasses so I couldn't see the crowd. So I wouldn't feel like people were, <laughs> so I can see people's facial expressions in case they were judging me. Looking ahead, the final section here, um, how do I see the role of dev advocacy evolving, especially with AI? Uh, I don't think developer advocacy is going anywhere. I don't know, you know, because the industry is changing so much, but I do think that because things are moving so quickly, what I would like to see with dev advocacy is just us being able to teach more people, empower more people to be able to use the AI tools so that they're not overtaken by AI, but can actually integrate AI into their workflows. And that can just empower people to just get better at their jobs. So I'm hoping to see more of that. I'm planning to still keep learning and growing myself. Um, and yeah, I've, I've really been having fun with it. So I, I plan to do that more, more Python, more open source. I want to do lots more projects uh, to help with Azure integrations and different open source projects. Okay, those were all of the questions that ChatGPT gave me. I'm not sure if I'm gonna get through all of them in the video. I might cut up some of them out because I don't want this to be super long. Um, if you have any other questions for me, please let me know in the comments. Um, that is gonna be it for today's video. 
if you enjoyed this video, if you would like to see more of these chatty style talking videos, please let me know in the comments and I will try to do that. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and I will see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>